when, I, when it came across my screen, if you want to say that, Kim, all of me was like, whoa, what is this? And there were certain parts of it that looked like it was shot here in, at, in the Atlanta area. I don't know if it was, man. It was, uh, absolutely. Hope High School is, or, is like literally five minutes from my house here, man. And so I was going, I want to know more about this. And then it took a different turn than what I thought it was going to take, Kim. I'll, I'll be honest. And so okay. how did you know this assignment was for you, man? Yeah, I, I was inspired initially. There was, a, there was a, a nugget, a spark, if you will. And that spark was a conversation, a conversation with a young boy, probably about nine or 10 years of age, who was sad because he couldn't run as fast as all the other boys hmm. in his class. And so he didn't want to run at all. You know, boys just say hello to each other and maybe push yeah. each other and then run off to play. And all the other boys could run fast and would get far away. And so he just didn't want to run at all because he said, he said, I know I'm fast, but all the other boys are super fast. Yeah. And couldn't keep up with them. And that made him sad, which, which touched me. And so that was the spark. And then of course, uh, if you go around any schools at all, but particularly elementary schools, yeah. if you're dropping off a child or something, you can always observe somebody getting a little bullied. And then you hear about stories in class and you see signs, you know, zero tolerance for bullying. Mm. So you put those things together and then we have so much division in society and people trying to exclude others who are different than they are. And so those sort of concepts about acceptance, about faith, about belief in oneself and about not judging others and allowing all others to flourish and to fly, that all sort of congealed in my head. And then I created this story. Hmm. Can we talk about the writing process for this story? And I mean, and you are a legitimate writer. I mean, like there are some <laughs> folks who are like, hey, like I, I have to really like muscle my way to the screen to write an article. You're like legitimate, man. What do you enjoy about writing? It's the experience of expressing ideas with no limitations. The process of here's my idea. I can sit down, then put those ideas on paper and then you have the ability to share those ideas with others because they can then read your writing but it's really about the freedom of expression you can sit there you know you have a little cursor on your computer it's just blinking and it's completely blank a blank page is kind of nice it's like restarting uh you know your life so to speak on an, on a daily basis especially if you get into this world of telling stories and you can go in any direction. And isn't that wonderful? It's like when you were a little kid. Oh. You know, nobody told you you couldn't do anything. You sit there and you think, I could tie a sheet to my back and I could fly, right? You think things like that when you're a kid. So th the fact is, you know, there's nothing there and then it will become something. And then you are the master of whatever it becomes. And I think that's uh, mm. a, a very enjoyable process is to be able to create, literally create something from nothing. Wow. And so what did you learn about you in this project? I mean, because there does seem to be, and I've not seen, I've only seen the different trailer pieces and the press stuff, but it seems like there's a turn somewhere in this story that I cannot wait to see it on the fifth. Um, what did you learn about you in the process? Well, that's, that's an intuitive question you're asking because as you write a story, you, mm -hmm you tend to put some of yourself and I think writing you, you dredge up sometimes different memories from your past that help you create characters and story arcs. And for me, this particular story uh, has a very strong uh, mother element to it and a very strong father element to it. Yeah. And 
they didn't always see the same things the same way. And I would say, even in my own life, you know, my mother and father were both mm. very strong uh, people in their own regard, but they didn't often see things the same way, especially when it came to me. Yes. You know, my would see me one way and my father would see me another yes. way. <laughs> I know so, that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> you know that feeling, right? I do. <laughs> and so it allowed me to sort of revisit things and to, to see wow. things differently. And oh. in some regards, it helped me, writing this story helped me to even, I believe, understand my father even a little bit more. How did you write and direct? Because most folks are just doing one or the other, typically. If I'm not, you know, I don't know much about Hollywood, but usually doing one or the other. You did both, man. Well, for me, the, to see the story told the way I intend it to be told literally means I have to drag it across the finish line. And, huh. so, and so as I write stories, I see the entire story and how I think it should be played out. And so I, I absolutely write for myself to direct because I consider it a job for me personally. Everybody's different, but personally, yeah. I see it as a job half done if I don't finish the process. That's a lot of work, Kim. That's a ton of work, man, to do both of them, man. <laughs> But it's but it's joyful work. It's the, oh. the the script is literally so that others can understand what needs to be done in order to fulfill the vision. But I have the story in my head, so I put it on paper, and then that that you can share with others so that we can all sort of row the boat in the same direction. But as far as the story, it's a story that I first tell on paper. But I absolutely always intend to be the one to put it on film. Wow. Now, from and, on, sorry, Kim, from putting it on paper to seeing it on film, do, do they come in two different lights to, to you where it's like, okay, I have it on paper, which is one certain sense, but when you see it, is it different from what you thought when you were writing it? Sometimes it is. Uh, yeah. Oftentimes, you, know, you get involved with now your, your crew and all the other creatives with whom you need to collaborate. Yeah. So it's not just yours anymore. That's the thing about writing. When it's writing, it's just mine. I'm sitting there at a computer. It's just me. And you can do, again, you're the master of your own universe. But once you take that script that, that um, has been created and polished and ready to um, be made into a film, now you have other creatives who are just as proud of their work as you are of yours and then what they can bring to the process. You know, you have your DP who's going to light um, and give you this, this visual sort of uh, canvas. You have to paint on this canvas, you collaborate. In this particular case, it was, you know, Bruce Lane was a wonderful DP, a local there in, uh, in and around Atlanta. And you have your producers who have to say, look, we can, we can get you these things to help you know, bring this to life, you know, the right house, the right locations, the money allocated in the right place. And, you know, the sound has to be just right. Your sound designers, your editors, there's so many people. Yeah. And, then, and then, of course, your actors have to become these characters. And sometimes they bring more to it than you can even imagine because they're pros as well. And once they take in this character, uh, within themselves and they begin to emote and it becomes real for them, then, you know, the character starts to speak to them as well. And oftentimes if you're open to it, they will take your character in a slightly different direction than you envision. But many times it's, it's even better than what you put on paper, but that's, that's the jump on paper sometimes wow. because it's a jumping, a jumping off point for them. Oh. And then they breathe life into those characters and you know, off you go and, and you sit there and you collaborate and then why don't we try it this way? And it might mean something for them. You know, they have their own past and their own backgrounds and where they might see a line that just triggers something in them and you didn't write cry here in the script, but maybe it brings tears to their eyes to say a certain thing. 
and, and and they have their own history. So, but it's a beautiful thing to watch it sort of flourish. You know, uh, even a script that becomes a film, it's like a child. You mold it and you send it out, but you know, you know exactly what it's going to do, yeah. and then you're there for guidance. And so, as a director, you're there to sort of guide the process, but you're not a dictator when you're making a film. Um, what one moment in the film? Uh, when in uh, Tyson's run, where you there was okay, I'm gonna put you on the spot on this one, Kim. So I'm gonna warn you first before I ask the question. There's, <laughs> a, there's a warning. What one moment in the film, and there, there may have been, there may, there may have been more than one, Kim, where you're directing it, you're you're in it, and you just knew that something spiritual was taking place. Um, what one moment that that you knew that was happening? I would have to say that there was a, uh, there's a scene in a church in the film. And I wanted a, a, an exterior shot of the church and the weather had been bad all day. Mm. And I wanted this particular shot. You have the steeple, you have the cross on the top of the, you know, of the steeple. And it was just an ugly sky. And the director of photography said to me, he says, you know, we're probably going to have to get this shot some other time. As a matter of fact, we will be done filming. Maybe I can come back wow. a week or two from now and get this shot because it's not going to be what you want. And I just stood there and I thought. That's discouraging. That's discouraging. <laughs> That's discouraging. And then magically, and then magically, the clouds started to clear and a beam of light came down across the church. <laughs> and I said, set the shot up, set the shot up. And then we just got this angle and it was white puppy clouds all of a sudden and this beam of light and there's the cross on the top of the church. And I got my shot. Now that might just have been a weather phenomenon. I don't know, but what I will tell you is it was supposed to be a cloudy, funky day and it cleared and I got the shot. And after I got the shot, it was another cloudy fun. I bet. Yeah, that's, that's funny that happens. And it's a cut. Okay, now let's go inside and shoot the interiors of, of this that's, church. That, that, that is pure art at its best, I think, man. Mm -hmm. When that happens, when it's like that moment comes in, whether it's in writing or in filming, where you go, let's go. And you got that, you got that. That minute, <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> what you got, man. There's a, I mean, the, the, sorry, the um, the people that you work with with it, with with this film are incredible. Bakari, I'm gonna pronounce his name terribly with a name like mine. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's you know, Barkhad Abdi. Barkhad yeah. Abdi is what you're trying to say. Yes. How did that come about working with him? And he's an Oscar nominee, in fact. That's right. And what was that like, man? No, oh, it was look all the actors. It was it was a a good time with all of them, really. And Barkhad, uh, you know, was no different. He, when you say how did it come about, every actor responded to the material to the screenplay, and it was sent to all of the actors we thought would be good in the role. And he, you know, was was one of them. Really, and if you know the list, I, I'm sure you have it there. It's I have the list, list, yeah. Yeah, so we have, you know, we got incredible we, list here. We got we got Major Dotson playing, pay, playing our our lead role as the young boy as Tyson. Got Rory Cochran. Um, you know, he read the script and came on in. Amy Smart was the same. Claudia Zavallos, Reno Wilson, um, Layla Felder. She was brand new, but again, it was. It's a great lineup. Script and, and, and Barkhad Abdi and, and all the rest, they they read the material and responded. And, and and that's the way it should be, because you don't want people showing up who don't believe in the material, right? right. Because then they're just showing up to get a paycheck. And, you know, if you're... That never works well. Yeah, that never, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't work well. <laughs> that anyway. never works well. And, that's, and, 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 and Barkhad was no different. You know, he's an actor. He... he was nominated for an Academy Award, and that's impressive. But each time he steps on a on a stage, he's got to prove himself all over again. Yeah. But you know, we had I had conversations with everyone. They got the material. And then it wasn't just here's the script and I'll do your movie. No, here's the script. Do you like it? Now let's talk about, you know, you know, expectations from both sides. And so that's really how it came together. Everyone 
who was there wanted to be there, believed in the project, and they believed in the material and the film that we were, you know, we were making and the story we attempted attempted to tell. Hmm. And they I, had to be engaged because sometimes a lot of it, you know, there's a lot of there's some rain, there's some storms, there are things when you know they're soaking wet and they got to be committed, right? <laughs> yeah, because you're all you are all in. Like there's no way out. I mean, I guess there's a way out, but you know what I'm trying to say here, Kim. Next to next, the last question here, and I'm gonna try to go fast here, man. Um, what do you want people to get out of this film? First of all, I would like them to be entertained because I believe we make films to stories that entertain people. You know, it's not my job to preach. It's my job to tell stories that wow. hopefully they can feel while they're there and maybe even talk about once they leave the theater. But my hope is that the takeaway is we just need to allow others their space to blossom, to believe, to soar, to be free. No matter whether we agree with how they are, who they are, or where they are, you know, in their own journey through this thing we call life. But let's understand that, you know, a selfishness with your beliefs means that you might be denying others. Yeah, man. You know, their for, deny others their opportunity to be, you know, their best selves. Yeah. And I, I would like folks to just say, you know what, maybe I need to dial it back a bit with my judgments of others and be more inclusive. Because, you know, nobody wants to be odd man out. Nobody wants to be that little girl who doesn't feel included in a, at, at the cool kids table at school. Yeah. Or parents who feel they have to make excuses for their children who might be challenged in some way mm. they should have just as much pride and they shouldn't hold them back you know sometimes you start feeling sorry for folks you start coddling them so much thinking you're protecting them and what you're really doing is denying them yeah you know their own uh, expression their own dreams and beliefs so I i'm just hoping that maybe if if a little spark of inspiration just to be kinder to others who might be different who yeah. might have challenges that you don't have, um, that would be a wonderful thing. I'd like to share this with you if I have a moment. There was a, yeah. we did a test screening in Houston, Texas. And after the screening, a father, kind of a strong looking, uh, I, I don't want to say a, like, a, like a blue collar, strong looking yeah. you know, man who, you know, salt of the earth kind of a guy. And he came out of the theater and he had a daughter with him and his daughter clearly had her challenges. I believe she had Down syndrome, maybe about 15 years of age, all dressed up, had her little dress on. And he sort of ushered her into the ladies room. And then once she had gone in, he came to me and said, I just want to thank you for making this movie. And he said, it made me realize that I need to be a better father to my daughter. Wow. And then he hugged me and then literally got tears on my jacket and then his daughter came out of the out of the room out of the ladies room and he put his arm around her and then walked her out of the theater wow so you know I, what i what i love about yeah. Christ, i love about christianity especially john three sixteen, the bible verse is where it says everybody you know i mean and i think sometimes we so miss that theme of mm -hmm. life that everybody gets in on this That's right. i mean it's not just one that god God wants everyone in. I think we, um, and I, it seems like the film, what I've seen so far, allows everyone to get in and it allows redemption and forgiveness to come out of it too, which is what I'm looking forward to seeing it on, on the yep, fifth year. Forgiveness of others and certainly forgiveness of yourself. Yeah. We're all you know, imperfect, right? So every, everyone gets in. Um, <laughs> You've hit gold a number of times, man. I mean, I'm just going to just say it straight <laughs> out here. Uh, it's one of those things. I told my wife this morning, um, I love interviewing with people. That part's exciting to me. The writing piece is where I oftentimes go, okay, here I go. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I got to go do this. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not the same. You got to hook, hook up the mule. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, here we go, you know? But I love 
I, I love the Marine Peace. I love being around writers. And you are a writer's writer, like hands down. Like you have struck gold once again a number of times from in living color to, <laughs> to sister sister to Keenan. Can you just explain to me in our in our few minutes here, closing out here, what is writing like to you and why do you think you struck gold so many times? Well, first of all, I think there's a lot of luck involved and I, you give me far too much credit for. Oh man, I, I, I mean, hands <laughs> down, I want to be clear on that. Thing. Clear on that, you are great at it. Well, I, I, I like ideas and, and when I was a kid, I, I liked stories. So mm. I, I find that I enjoy telling stories, but when you draw from truth, it makes it a lot easier to create. And the things that you've seen when you mentioned Keenan and Cal, that was really based upon my childhood with my best friend. So, you know, that was my truth. And so you, you, that's a jumping off point, but if you have, that's a foundation. And as you know, if you don't have a strong foundation, you don't have anything. So, um, so it, it was a natural sort of fit. Sister, sister, well, I have twin sisters. I grew up with twins. And so I sort of understood, I certainly observed how they interacted. My older sisters, Janice and Joyce, they're a year and a half older than I am. So, you know, I when I come to life, there were always twins just there holding my hand, taking care of me and doing their things. The sister, sister was also a natural. And then of course, I, I was fortunate enough to be a staff writer on In Living Color. Well, I come from a family of really funny, people, really funny storytellers, aunts and uncles, my brothers and sisters, uh, they're all very funny. If you ask them, they're much funnier than I am. Mm. And so I can just sort of steal from, you know, my past and say, what would my uncle say here that would be funny? What would my sister say here that would be funny? And I'll, I'll, I'll share this with you. When I was a writer on In Living Color, my grandparents would they watched another show. My grand, I think they watched Murder, She Wrote or something at the same time. And so what they would do is turn the channel at the end of the show they liked just to watch the credits for In Living Color. So every Sunday, my grandfather would say, Sincho name on Sunday, just the name going up the screen in the credits. And he liked seeing that, but he never watched the show. So I asked my grandmother once, I said, Grandma, did you ever watch In Living Color? And she said, oh, no, that's just a bunch of color folks acting crazy. <laughs> it was a family. I, <laughs> I, said, I said, I said and so my grandmother said to me, well, what do you do? I said, well, Grandma, I write some of the jokes. And she said, and they pay you for that? <laughs> <laughs> just like, that can't be happening. But I, no, I mean, you're such a writer. And I told my wife this morning, once again, I was like, man, I want to get to where he's at. And, and for me, Kim, it is such one of those things where the goal is to, like, I think on a scale of one to 10, I'm about a six or a seven when it comes to enjoyment. I mean, maybe, maybe a six on a good day for like <laughs> five. Um, but I, I want to get there. And so this is not a question, man, but do you ever like mentor guys like me, for example, <laughs> who want to be better writers, man? Man, you, you put me in a spot. Here's the thing. I really don't think I'm that good at it. I'm learning every time I strap Are into a serious? seat. Are you serious? Every time I strap into a seat, I don't know Heck if this is no. good or not Heck good. No, man. And you, you just, you have to, you know, people say, mentor, I've read things that other people have uh, written once I get, you know, sort of close to them. Excuse me. <clears throat> but I sit there and I, if I read something that somebody else wrote, most of the time I can't understand it because I didn't create it. It's a weird yeah. thing for me. No, I, I didn't it. create it, so then I don't really understand it. And I, I, it. I, I write what I know, but what I, what I have told people, I've, I've done a couple of talks and some speeches to other writers. And I first, I say, look, yeah, I have some credits that you might know about, but what I'm going to tell you is every single time I strap into that chair to write a story, it's like starting all over again. And I never know if it's any good. So I tell folks, the best advice I can give any other writers is write what you know, or certainly what you feel, and then figure out a way to make that entertaining because it's not a journal. It's not your own personal journal. Now you're trying to express yourselves to others. And 
and then make sure that you understand that it's art and commerce. You're writing something that you're expecting someone else to literally hand you money for and maybe invest a lot of money to create it. So you have to look at it in those terms, like what is interesting? How well can I tell this story to make it as interesting as possible? And then certainly understand that it ultimately becomes a creative endeavor that has to merge with a commercial endeavor. And it needs to sort of pop a little bit off the page because people have to invest in it. So it's almost like pitching. If you're going to pitch, if you've got a friend say, hey, why don't we open up this bar? And then you better make a pretty good pitch why you want him to give you half of his uh, savings and half of his retirement money to open up this bar. And you have to say, it's this location. We got this kind of traffic. We're going to serve this kind of food. There's a baseball stadium right across the street. And then I think after two years, you know, we're going to be pulling down a quarter of a million dollars in profits every year. And it will grow from there. And then we can franchise. Okay, you got to make your pitch like that. Well, it's the same when you're writing something that you expect somebody to put money in. It's right. art. I can't just commerce. say hey. art and right. commerce. Art and that is, and commerce. I, I right. never yeah. thought about that before. That's art. Mm -hmm. that, that's the the film will open on March 11th. Friday, March 11th okay. is the official opening of the film, and then the premiere is on February 25th in Atlanta. 